Welcome back, my friend, Mr. Alviar. We are going to be finishing the rest of chapter 12 tonight. We left off. Daniel is on his way to the mill to get some uh, corn ground for he and Will. I guess they're running out. And he actually is there. Um, no, he's on his way there. He's on his way there when he hears something behind him. And he was really worried. In fact, he started looking around to find a tree to climb, but the tree that he was closest to was not a good enough tree. So he was uh, looking all over the place, and as he was searching, the creatures came in sight. He looked around frantically for a smaller tree, just when the creatures came into sight. Turkeys. Six or seven wild turkeys. Their oval bodies were so dark they blended into the low brush. Their long necks and small bluish colored heads were bent to the ground looking for food. Daniel didn't know who was more surprised, he or the turkeys. They squawked. The birds flapped their wings, making them look suddenly fat. And then they were gone, running quickly for such awkward-looking creatures. They disappeared into the trees. Daniel had to smile. The turkeys had looked so shocked to come upon him and so funny running away. But a minute later, he felt that old uneasiness creeping over him again, nodding his insights. Because you never knew what you would encounter in these woods. That was the thing. You just never knew what might lurk among these dark, looming, unfriendly trees. So Daniel didn't linger any longer. He walked quickly, his eyes alert, his hand ready to reach for his knife. And he didn't stop again until the sun was high in the sky, coming around a bend in the creek, which by now had dwindled to a small trickle of a stream. Daniel finally saw what appeared to be a shed. It was roughly built, two stories high but open below. In the open part, there were two horses, and they were walking in a circle. What was this? Not the mill that Daniel had expected, not the kind that he knew back home in Pennsylvania. There, a mill was a sturdy-looking building, likely built of stone, with a large turning wheel on the outside situated on a swiftly moving water. As he came closer, he saw that the horses were pushing against long poles that were turning something. A good-sized post, it looked like, that ran up into the second story. Then he remembered that Grandpap had talked one time about mills powered by horses instead of water. A man stepped out of the shed. He was bulky, dressed in layers of torn and dirty clothing, his bearded face shaded by a wide-brimmed hat. He pushed back the hat, staring at Daniel. Howdy there, boy, he greeted him. His face was friendly enough, Daniel thought. Uh, howdy, sir, he said, setting down his meal sack. Name's Tom Cochran, the man went on, thrusting his hand outward. This here's my horse mill. Daniel's hand was nearly crushed in his grip. I'm Daniel Griffith, he said. The man nodded. Heard tell you folks was settling around here. Uh, where's your pa today? Uh, he's gone to Pennsylvania to fetch my ma and the rest of the family, sir. He'll be back any day now, Daniel answered. He sounded just like he had when he talked to Solomon, he thought. Wishful thinking. I was wondering if I could get some meal. You got some corn to grind? Tom Cochran looked around as if he expected Daniel 
had hidden it somewhere. Uh, no, sir. I'd need it on account. You see, my pa will pay you when he gets here. It's just me and my brother have about run out. The miller looked him up and down. And then he shrugged his large shoulders. I guess I can do that, he agreed. Only you'll have to wait. I got those two boys ahead of you. He motioned at two men that Daniel hadn't even noticed before. They were around the side of the shed, one leaning against it, the other standing with what looked like a small axe in his hand. As Daniel watched, the man reared back and threw the axe at a slim sapling tree, and it split the wood right down the middle, and both men laughed loudly. Might as well sit down and make yourself comfortable, Tom Comfort said, walking back into the shed. Daniel heard wood creaking and grinding stones rumbling inside as the mill turned. He meandered over to where the two men were standing. Howdy, he said. The young man with the axe was Jake Hutchins. and The other was his brother, Sam Hutchins. They were both scrawny, thin, like whips of sapling trees. The two of them lived over by Wolf Creek, Jake told him. Daniel wasn't sure where that was, but from the direction that Jake pointed, he could tell that it wasn't close to their cabin. Jake was the talkative one, helped out by a bottle that he and Sam kept passing back and forth. You see this here tomahawk, he said, turning the axe over in his hand. Our pa got it off an Indian he killed back in 93. Yep, our pa and his brothers killed them a pack of redskins, Drove those varmints out of the country pretty much all by themselves. Daniel thought of Solomon and his sad eyes. Solomon wasn't a varmint, but he didn't say anything. Better just keep quiet and listen. Jake was full of stories. First about the horse mill, Daniel sat and cracked nuts while Jake talked. Used to be he began. A man named Logan had himself a water mill here, but then the dry years came along and this here creek shrunk up to nothing. So old man Logan shut down. A couple years back, Tom Cochran got the idea of running the mill by horsepower. It takes longer and you got to supply your own horses, but it does the job. Better than going all the way to Willow Springs. That story sounded true enough, but Daniel wasn't so sure about some of the other ones. I expect you heard of Dayton Riley, haven't you, boy? Daniel shook his head. Well, Dayton Riley was the greatest hunter in all the Northwest Territory. He lived right near here in a great big sycamore tree. That's right, made himself a home inside a hollow old tree. He dressed all in buckskins and had a beard that came down halfway to his toes. He was quite a sight, I can tell you. He'd hunt anything that moved, but bears was his particular favorite. Claimed to have shot over 500 of them. Ma always said, stay away from Dayton O'Reilly. He's crazy as a coot. But me and Sam, we talked to him once, didn't we, Sam? Sam nodded. Gave us the skin of a bear cub, and Ma made it into winter hats. Well, that led to another story. Speaking of crazy as a coot, said Jake, puts me in mind of Mad Mary. She was an Indian fighter. After her husband was killed in the French War, she went on the warpath against all of them by herself. She dressed like a man, shot like a man, and drank whiskey and chewed tobacco like a man, and rode a big black horse. The Indians could never catch her, and after a while got to be afraid of her. They was the ones that gave her the name Mad Mary. Well, what happened to her? Daniel asked. She lived to be a ripe old age, built herself a little cabin made of all fence rails, I hear tell and lived there like a wild animal. Had no furnishings, not even a bed. Once in a while, she'd paddle her canoe to the nearest town, 
gun slung over her shoulder and scare all the young folks. Sam took another swig from the bottle. Yep, he said. Them was the days before this here country started getting all settled up. All settled up? Daniel couldn't help being surprised why these woods were empty as far as he could tell. But Jake nodded. Folks is coming in from everywhere. Kentucky, Carolina, Tennessee. Why, we got a neighbor not ten miles from our place. I even hear talk of them building a school. Mom would be, Mom would be glad to hear that, Daniel thought. It was one of her worries about moving out here that they'd all grew up being ignorant. Truth to tell, he'd be glad of it too. Daniel missed the books. The old schoolmaster, Mr. James. He missed the books like Morris's Geography and Pilgrim's Progress. The only book that Pa and Ma had was the Bible. Well, if it comes to that, then building a school, Sam said, shaking his head. We're moving on farther west where there's room to breathe. It was strange, Daniel thought, that something could look one way to one person and just the opposite to another. Well, as Ma would say, that's what makes the world go round. Tom Cochran came around the other side of the shed. You two are all set, he said, unless you uh, want to lend this boy the use of your horses for his meal. Of course we can. Jake agreed, and he and Sam didn't seem in any hurry to leave. Now they were chewing on some dried meat jerky. I surely do thank you, said Dan. A few stories and swigs from the bottle later, Jake and Sam loaded their meal sacks onto their horses. Daniel lifted his half-filled sack onto his shoulder. It was heavy. He could have used Will's help in carrying it. But still, he was glad that he'd come alone. My pa will be over to pay you, he told Tom Cochran. Waving goodbye to Jake and Sam, Daniel set off for home. As he rounded the bend in the creek, Daniel noticed that the sun was starting to sink down behind the trees. He'd stayed longer than he planned. What with the slow grinding of the horse mill and all Jake's stories, it had been good to hear voices other than his own and Will's, you know, to know they weren't quite alone out here. But he should have been paying attention, he told himself. Now he was going to have to hurry to get back to the cabin before dark. And there was the meal sack, you see. It was heavier than he'd expected. He was going to have to stop and rest now and again on his way. But it was a good thing that he'd marked the trail with his knife. With those blazed trees to follow, at least he didn't have to worry about getting lost. Daniel hurried along as fast as he could, along the slowly widening creek. Turn north up that small rise. Keep an eye out for the next blazed tree. Ah, there it is. And every now and then he would look up at the sun. Don't you go down yet, he would say. Stay out a little longer. He had to stop to rest several times, but he didn't rest long. Just took a bite of Johnny Cake or a quick drink from the creek, shifted the meal sack to the other's shoulder, and kept walking. The sun kept sliding down, lower and lower, and then, in a blink, it was gone. And all that was left was a faint glow in the west. But he didn't have much farther to go. Daniel told himself that he could make it. He could still see the trail, and the fresh cuts that he'd made stood out against the dark trunks of the trees. It was going to be all right. Slowly, everything turned to gray. Light gray, darker gray, and then and that was when Daniel began to hear things. Tiny rustlings, the smallest movement in the tree above his head, 
Is anything there? Or was he just getting spooked by the coming darkness? A minute later, he was sure something was following him. Something on quiet, padded feet. He could hear it plainly behind him. And maybe it was more than one. Wolves? Could it be wolves? Daniel turned around quickly and caught a glimpse of a dog-like dark shadow moving into the trees. A wolf, for sure. And most likely more. Maybe even a whole pack of them. His heart started pounding. Daniel struggled to think, what should he do if wolves were following him? Had Pa ever said anything about it? Or Grandpap? He couldn't remember. All he could think of was what Pa had said that time about the wolves going after the weak and the wounded. Just keep walking, he decided. Don't let them think you're weak or scared. He glanced over his shoulder again. This time he saw nothing but the long black legs of the tree. Oh, why had he waited so long to start back? How had he allowed himself to be walking through the woods in the darkness? Now those trees, they, they seemed to be answering his questions. Foolish, he said. Foolish. Foolish. He was nearly to the cabin, he thought. It had to be just around the next bend. He kept walking, feeling the heavy weight of the meal sack on his aching shoulder. Don't look back, he told himself. Don't look back. Just keep going. Footsteps padded behind him. They seemed to be coming closer. But Daniel stumbled on. And all at once, he saw it. He almost got there for him. Whew. Imagine. Imagine what it would be like a 12-year-old. First of all, a 12-year-old and a 9-year-old living in the woods, in a forest, with nobody around to help. And you're all alone in the middle of the night. Well, it's late at night, I guess. But it's dark. It's pitch black dark. Remember, the trees block out the sun. They, they're most likely blocking out half the moonlight as well. And you hear these animals behind you, walking alongside you, coming from the right side, the left side, from behind you. And they sound like they're coming closer. I don't even know what I would do. I can imagine what it feels like, though. All right, my friends, I hope you're all doing well. I hope everybody is uh, happy and healthy and your families are also happy and healthy. But it's time to go brush those teeth. It's time for you to wash your hands and your face, get into your pajamas and hug, kiss those mom and dads and grandma and grandpas, whoever's there taking care of you. Tell your siblings you love them too. And be good. Go to bed and get a good night's sleep. Think happy, wonderful thoughts. Like Bo. Can you hear him barking back there? Yeah, my wife's telling him to be quiet. <laughs> but he needs his daddy to come tell him to be quiet. And that would be me. All right. Have a good night, everybody.